And thanks everyone for coming out to, uh, to learn about crop planning. Um, so I'm Dan, and I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more in a moment, but I thought we'd start with some, uh, some beginner reflections. Um, and so there's a handout that, that you would have received at the beginning, and there's all kinds of fantastic questions on that handout. And some of them, especially at the beginning, I'm going to ex specifically ask you these questions, or I mean, you can answer them. I'm not going to have everybody answer them all one by one. Um, some of the questions I don't explicitly stay here, but they kind of go along with the presentation. Um, you don't have to write anything on that if you don't want to. <laughs> but one of the things that I found um, is that if you're thinking about things, getting them down on paper is a way to look at them and to be able to organize them and either choose to go ahead or choose to do something different. And so it's a really good tool to kind of manage your thoughts, even if it's just scribbles in a, in a session. So I'd encourage you to do something with this. Um, you could use the questions as they're stated or go freestyle. Um, and so these are, the, this is the beginning of the planning process is to kind of think about, you know, who you are. And um, so two questions are, why would you want to grow? Why do you want to grow vegetables? And why would, do you want to sell vegetables? And another would be, what annual profit do you want to make? And that term annual profit, that's pocket that you're put, uh, not po money you're putting in your pocket over the year. So it's not your gross sales. This would be the total revenue you make. If you were working at a job, it would be your salary. Uh, so it's kind of what you're paying yourself. Um, anybody want to tell me why they want to grow and sell vegetables? One person? I'm sick of the job I have. <laughs> sick of the job you have. Ready to be sick of something else. No. <laughs> or excited. <laughs> Hopefully excited, yeah. Other reasons? We're in a hospitality field, and I really want to find out how I can, you know, fill the guidelines to put the proper soil in to sell to our clients. OK. Like farm soil. OK, yeah. Okay. So that's kind of completing the loop. Correct. Yeah. Because you love it. Yeah, that's, that's a good reason. <laughs> I like to eat them, so I would like to get paid for growing vegetables. Okay, yeah. You're already eating the food, so make that eating more profitable. <laughs> yeah. Any other reasons? Um, we can start with you. Yeah. We, uh, I, don't, I don't think we have a stable food system, so I don't want to rely on that. Yeah. So, and, and you mean, so you want to have, you don't think we have a stable food system, that means you want to have Better food than you can maybe get somewhere else, and food that you trust. Yeah, that, and I just don't think it's sustainable in the future. So yeah. Might as well get started now. Yeah, have those skills ready in case the food system collapses. Because I'm hopefully it's not a matter of when. Hopefully we can right. learn. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Sure yeah. Okay. One last. We live in a food desert county, mm -hmm. and we want to offer healthy um, food to those who may not be able to afford it. <coughs> So, you, so you want to have bring good food to to places where there might not be much food available. Period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to ask this next question also, and I, I recognize it's a sensitive question. But let's say you were a new farmer launching a market garden. What what profit would you be happy to have in your in your pocket at the end of your first year? And this is not one size question for everybody, or it's the same. Any, so a bu zero plus. <laughs> We're starting at a good, a lot of potential here. Not losing money the first year. Okay, if we had to put a number other than zero. Nothing maybe gets the next step of my property. Okay, yeah, so, so a good, a stepping stone, something that's gonna make you feel like you got something. Make, make enough to where now I want a greenhouse, so I want, I want enough. Yeah, okay. How about, you know, another way to think about this question is five years down the line. You've been doing this for five years. There's a lot of work that goes into it. What would make you happy at that point to be generating revenue? I'd like to replace the salary from my full-time job right now. Okay. Yeah. 
And so this question here is a personal question. You know, and it's based on what your lifestyle is. Do you have a mortgage? Do you have kids? You know, and um, it could be very high. <laughs> it could be lower, you know. Um, but it's a really important reflection. To, to, this, this is a really, really important num, uh, number to, to know because this is kind of one of the ways, this is what you're, you're, you're gonna, we're going to ta be targeting towards. Um, well, I got this thing. So here's some other questions. How much acreage do you have? Do you just have an acre? Do you have 10 acres? Do you have 100 acres? And a corollary question is, how much are you going to farm of that? Because just because you have 100 acres doesn't mean you go out and grow vegetables on 100 acres. You could still have a half acre garden on 100 acres. And maybe that one acre that you're doing, think that's so big, you could just have a quarter acre. <laughs> but, um, so you don't have to use everything, but it's good to know what you have. And how much experience do you have? And experience, here I'll tell you to describe your vegetable growing experience um, to yourself. <laughs> but experience isn't just vegetable growing. There's also the marketing. You know, um, there's the bookkeeping and all the accounting. Um, there's any kind of machinery or maintenance type experience that you have. There's dealing with staff, the HR. Those are all skill sets that um, are very important to have on a farm. And it's good to be honest with yourself about where your weaknesses are because that's the places that you want to, uh, to, to address. And um, if you have, so if you've been farming for a while, there's a good chance that your vegetable growing experience is higher. Maybe some of the other things aren't as, ex as high. If you're coming from another field, you know, either studies or you're working something else, and now you're going into farming and you haven't farmed before, definitely you should get some farming experience. You want to build that up. That's going to be valuable on a farm. But you should also recognize that there might be some stuff that you did in your other life that are very transferable. And you might be very well set up to do marketing or to build relationships with, uh, with people um, to, 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 to manage staff. And so those don't neglect those. Just because you're a beginner beginning in the growing peer, uh, uh, place and there's a lot of challenges that come along, it's good to realize that you have a lot of strengths that maybe other farmers might be struggling with if they've really been strength focusing on the growing pit piece. So it takes, we wear a lot of hats as, uh, as farmers and um, you want to have good hats. Um, and then I guess this is kind of continuing that thought is what are your vegetable growing weaknesses and what are your weaknesses in other parts of, of the business and what you need to learn to be a better farmer. And so it's identifying what those weaknesses are and deciding how you're going to go forward um, is, 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 a, is a really important, um, um, I guess, point to, to think about. And so these are the beginning reflections to kind of start off the process that we're jumping into. Um, myself, uh, I'm Dan Brisbois. I'm part of Turnersoil Cooperative Farm. Turnersoil is French for sunflower. Um, kind of like in Spanish, girasol means turn to the sun, so does, so does tonasal. It's also a play on words, which means turn the soil, um, which we do a fair amount of. And um, we started farming, we started our farm in the fall of 2004. We were five uh, people who'd met studying agriculture and working on farms, and we decided to, to launch our business together. And we incorporated as a worker co-op, so it's a, it's a business structure like being a corporation or a partnership, but as a worker co-op. And, uh, and we chose that model um, because we wanted, it's, it's a model where each person has one vote independent of number of shares in the business. So we were looking for something that we felt was more equitable in terms of uh, representing the voices. Over the years, we've had two more people join our co-op. So we're seven people running the co-op and we have six employees. So it's 13 people uh, on our farm. And um, I, you know, I'm here talking about crop planning. But I do want to acknowledge that my experience, the last 15 years, I've been farming with this team. And so though I won't explicitly be talking about them all the time, they're kind of permeating everything that, that I'm, that, that I'm the, 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 the eyes, the lens that I'm, that I'm, I'm looking through. Um, and so we're outside, of, we're outside of Montreal, about 45 minutes west of Montreal. Um, it's a little bit of a ways away from here. So it's just, it's, we're in Canada and Quebec. So it's, I don't know, maybe, 15-ish hours drive to get there. Um, our climate is, I think, colder than you are. From chatting with some people, I think that our spring, like we start, we're about five or six weeks later 
then, then you might be here. Um, and so today, when I'm talking about dates, don't trust the dates. Trust the process. You know? So it's the thinking that's important, not the specific information about dates that I'm, that I'm talking about. And you know better what can grow in your areas. Um, yeah. So on our farm, we are market gardeners and we're seed growers. Um, we do 500 uh, weekly vegetable baskets that people come and pick up um, every week. And that's grown on six acres. And we also grow seeds, vegetable seeds, flower seeds, herb seeds. We have an online store. And then we sell seeds through seed racks and other stores. Um, and our seed is produced on about one acre, but we also buy in seed from a network of other seed growers. And so we have seven acres in production on our farm. And uh, maybe to take a bigger step back, our total farm is 17 acres. Once you take out path and barns, you're down to 12 acres of cultivated field. And of those 12 acres of cultivated field, we have seven acres of cash crop, of which six of veg and one of seed. So there's five acres that will be in cover crops in any given year, and we'll ro rotate through those. And we'll talk about cover crops, uh, not cover crops, crop rotation at the end of the day. Um, so this is who, what our farm is. Um, and then in addition to farming, I also write a lot about farming and seeds. So there's, there's a crop planning book that got previously mentioned. I also have a blog, goingtoseed.net, where I write about you know, growing commercial quality seed. Um, so those are my hats. So this is what we're here to do. What is crop planning, though? What are you thinking we're, we're, we're going to be learning? Somebody want to hazard a guess? Location and quality? Hmm? Location and quantity? Location and quantity of what you're growing? Yeah? Beginning with the end in mind. Beginning with the end in mind. I like that. Yeah. One last thought or goal? How much carbon you're putting in the ground? Yeah. I'm not going to talk as much about carbon, but it is a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so crop planning is figuring out what to grow, how much of it to grow, and when to plant. And this is kind of with that end goal in mind. And you want to do this before the season begins. Because when you do it during the season, we call that crisis management. <laughs> and some of you may be familiar with that. Um, but Essentially what crop planning is, is that you're farming in your head and you're running through your season before you actually do it so that you're ready for your season when it actually happens. And I mean also by crop planning you know you have the seeds on hand and you have the tools on hand. But if you can't make it work on paper or in a computer, it might be hard to make it work in reality. So is this what you're here to learn? I hope so. So I, have, I, I am the co-author of this book, Crop Planning for Organic Vegetable Growers. And, um, in the book itself, we go through an 11-step process that goes, drills really into the, into the numbers. And some of it I am going to present to here, but I'm going to do a lot of stuff that's also not in the book. And um, so this is what, I, what we're going to do. We're going to start off by setting goals, where you want to get to. You know? And so quality of life is definitely an important part of that. But we're going to talk a lot about dollars. We're going to talk about kind of financial goals. And when, by knowing how much you want to make, then, the next thing, so working backwards, is you want to figure out your marketing plan. How are you, what do you need to sell and who are you going to sell it so that you can make the revenue that you're targeting? Once you've figured out what you're going to grow and how you, uh, and, uh, and how you want to sell it, then you've got to figure out how you're going to grow the crop to make that. And that's the crop plan. Um, so this is, this step here kind of going backwards. And we might finish this step before lunch or we might finish it after lunch. It's going to depend on how we're going and uh, you know, what kind of questions we have. And, and do feel free to ask questions as you go along and I'll either answer them or not. <laughs> if I don't answer them, it's because the stuff is coming down the line. Um, once we've gone through this, we're going to start thinking about scale. I'm sure you've all heard about farmers that are growing, I don't know, $100,000 on one third of an acre and they just work one day a week or something. Um, <laughs> And there's, I mean, there's all kinds of farm models out there. And, um, and I mean, I guess I'll, 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 I'll start off by saying there's not one right farm model. We need farms of all size to have a good food system. It's possible, though, there's a right farm model for you. And so we're going to talk about what different scales are from the smallest 
to mediumish. I'm not going to jump into the largest today, uh, though we might allude to them. And so just to kind of know where you're situated in that and how it might affect other decisions you're making. We'll talk about record keeping or why you might not want to keep records. Um, and then we're going to talk about making your plan work. Um, and we're probably, like, this is probably going to bring us to about 3 to 4 o'clock in terms of content. So we're going to have one to two hours at the end of the day to kind of talk about other things. There's a lot of stuff that I'm not talking about in here because you can't fit it all in. And so we'll see what people want, what kind of other questions people have that we want to, we want to get more focused on at the end. So, um, so this is the plan. Are you all on board for this? Good. So let's set our goals. When we choose, so why do you want to grow and sell vegetables? So when we choose to farm, you, often cho you might choose because you love having your hands in the dirt. You like the physical work. You like to be outside. This is often a thing that goes into it. Um, you like to have fun. <laughs> you don't want to be just stressed out. Um, there's often a, compo a community component that goes into it also. Either the people that you're feeding or the people that you're working with. Um, is very important. And then there's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, there's passion that goes into it. There's the beauty. Um, there's making a better ecological system, you know, uh, contributing to, uh, to, to, to the world in all kinds of ways. And all these things are why we choose to farm. And then there's money. And if revenue was the only thing that you wanted to make, it's possible farming might not be your first choice. <laughs> Though it, sh it, should, it, it could be also, but, but it's in a context of so many other things that you want to do that you're choosing farming, and it's really your quality of life. And those are really important, and it's important to know why you want to farm, but it's also important to know how much you have to make. Because if, and so not everybody also farms to make a living. Sometimes you have an off-farm job, and you're just farming to keep sane. And, um, and, and that's, that's good also. That's great if you don't have the same financial pressures. Just try not to make, drive yourself crazy with your farm in that case. And, you know, we often, sometimes there's an aspiration to become a full-time farmer. There's nothing that makes you have to only be a full-time farmer. It can be a challenge. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And the profits, um, though they can be phenomenal, can be a struggle sometimes. And so it can make sense to be, have, you know, a full-time or part-time job and then farm on the weekends or during the evenings to, to reduce that, 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 that load. Or, or also as you're learning and figure out how to, uh, how to, how to, how to, how to transition. So um, one way or the other, you need to know what your, your salary is, what your profit is that you're trying to make during the year. Now for this, for, for this equation, or not this equation, this hypothetical situation, I'm just throwing a number of $20,000. This is, not pre this is not prescriptive. It's just a number to have a number, you know? And so you start with what you want to make. Now, um, in holistic management, which is a, a farm management system, in the financial planning parts, they recommend that 50% of your gross sales should be your profit. So if you were using that metric of 50%, so we're going to figure out our farm income, we can double it. Right, so 50% of 40,000 would be 20,000. So trying to make $20,000 in your pocket, you'd have to sell $40,000 with this approach. And then you have expenses. Who can tell me how much you have for expenses? Not all at once. <laughs> 20,000, is that where you guys are going? So it's simple math. And it's very simplistic as opposed to having a very big budget. And you should keep a budget, you should make a plan, you should monitor your expenses, but you should think about your farm also in this way. And, um, and, and, and the thing that you're thinking about first is that profit. This is what you are farming for. You're not farming because you want to have a 300 member CSA and you just want to feed a lot of people and so you're kind of focusing on this. And you don't, you're not farming just to have tractors and build greenhouses and buy seeds which is this, you're farming, it's to make a living. And so this is where you have to be focused on. And what that means that if you 
can't make that 40 thou, but you want to make 20 thou in your pocket, you've got to cut here. You don't cut here. Um, and if you're making extra money, if you choose if, if you choose to not put in expenses, it's going to go there. So it's trying to really control your expenses so that this is, is what's coming first. Um, because it's so easy to just start growing, start selling, paying the bills as they come in, and at the end of the year there's nothing left. Or there's just a small amount left. And, um, and, uh, but you know there's a lot of work that went into it. And so what this means on a practical level is that you have, so other than planning, is that you have to figure out a way to capture this. And, oh, <laughs> gotta be careful there. Um, um, maybe I'll put this down here so I'll walk in front of it. Um, so the first thing is you wanna have a separate bank account for your farm than for your own business. And on a regular basis, perhaps it's bi weekly, perhaps it's monthly, you wanna transfer money from the farm account to your own, like if you're giving yourself a paycheck. And by doing that, that money is no longer available to spend on other things. So you can actually see that, you can see how much you have left. Um, and when do you start doing that? If this is your first year and you've made no sales, maybe it's too early to start paying yourself a paycheck. But as soon as sales start coming in, you wanna be bringing a percentage of that, transferring that over, um, regularly. And if you're in your second, third, fourth year, you want to try to do that even during the winter. Now cash flow can be tough during that time, but the more close you can get to it, the easier it is going to be to maintain that profit. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, um, kind of, this might seem, 50, keeping 50% 50 of your revenue can seem like a lot. Um, I have seen farms that are holding more than 50%, you're holding 50, 60, or 70%, especially on the smallest farms, like farms that are like a quarter acre, a half acre, that don't have a lot of staff. Um, they can really control their expenses to a minimum and capture more of the profit. It can be harder on a larger farm with staff to, 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 to keep that profit, but sometimes there's a bigger potential of, of actual dollars that you have. But you do want to, to, to know where that is. If you're in a situation, where you're making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, hundred thousand dollars a year, but you're only netting five or ten thou over the whole year. That's a lot of work to make that five or ten thou. Alternatively, you could scale your farm down, and let's say it's actually five thousand that you're netting, you could aim for ten thousand of gross sales. Um, it's a lot less work, and you might find that you make more than that. If, if, if you're kind of shrinking in. Um, so, yeah. Now, in terms of what's realistic, these numbers really change from region to region and change a lot in function of what prices are available. But if you're a new farmer with limited or no experience, you can probably gross about five to $10,000 of, 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 uh, of sales per person working in the field. And um, if you have a bit of experience on working on other farms and now you're launching yourself, you can probably make more than that. But if you don't have um, that experience, this is kind of, I think, a realistic goal. This is, this is you probably can't make a living off of that, but there's a lot to learn and this is not gonna push you too far. As an experienced farmer, so somebody who's been farming for a while, has a well-running operation, you can probably be making $40,000 of gross sales per person. So this is you know, per person working the full season. And you might have one experienced farmer with three newbie staff. All those newbie count at that $40,000. You know, so it's becoming a potential of like, like $160,000 um, if you have a, a well-running operation. Now, as I said, it depends partially on what kind of prices you can get in your area. Um, and there are some situations where people can make a lot more than this. But, um, but it's good to be realistic of where you're going to wind up. Okay. Right. So once you know how much you need to make, that's time to figure out how you're going to sell it. So that's, that's the, your, your marketing plan. And there are some pieces to this. Um, you need to know what you're going to grow, you know, how much you're going to charge for it, 
how you're going to sell at different distribution methods, and then what you need to harvest on a weekly basis to meet those marketing outlets. And we're going to go through these pieces um, one by one. So what are you going to grow? And the answer should be profitable crops. <laughs> but what makes a crop profitable? Now, there's a lot of things that can make a crop profitable. And um, if you're talking about a true profit analysis, you start off with your income for that, all the uh, from that crop minus all the expenses associated with that crop. And labor is an expense, so that all goes in there. And you do income minus expense, and you have profit at the end. And hopefully it's a profit and not a loss. And if you can do that for all your crops, that's a really great thing to do. But it takes time. Sometimes it's hard to have you know, exact information about how much time you spend on each thing. And I've, find it, I, I've seen very few farmers that really have done it on all their crops. So these are five more metrics or benchmarks that I think are more realistic for most farms to look at. So dollars per acre is the amount of space it takes to grow. Dollars per, har dollars per harvest hour is how long it takes to harvest. How, the time on the ground is you know, literally, you know, from planting to harvest, how long is it on the ground? How long do they take care of it? How hard is it to grow the crop? How much expertise does it take? And then, can you sell all of the crop you're growing? These five items are what's going to make a crop, or are a way to evaluate if a crop is profitable for you. So, to start off, um, with this, I do want to just define a little bit of some of the words I'm going to use. Um, so here we have a bed of lettuce. There's three rows of, bed of lettuce. This blue block is um, supposed to have three rows, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's not showing up for some reason. Maybe I deleted one. I don't know. But um, so there's three rows on it. And I talk often in terms of bed feet. And so a bed foot is, if you had the full length of the bed, it's a one foot long strip. That's the whole width of the bed. So it's that red block. So in one foot of bed, how much do you have? Now, um, a row foot is in one foot of row. You have one row foot. So if you had three rows of lettuce, a bed foot is equal to three row feet. Is that clear? If you had two rows of broccoli, a bed foot of broccoli is two row feet of broccoli. And if you had tomatoes at one row, in the bed, a bed foot of tomatoes is a row foot of tomatoes. There's like no difference at that point. So if I talk about bed feet, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Here are some benchmarks. Can you, can you see the, the color scheme is a little bit dark, but can you see this? Yeah. So here are some benchmarks, and this is based on a five foot bed width. And so what a five foot bed width, um, we'll just draw right here is if you have a tractor, you've got the wheels of the tractor. So the center of the tractor wheel to the center of the next tractor wheel, this, in this case, would be five foot. So there's a low part, and then there's a, a bed. And this is where the, the tractor is rolling, and the bed's in the middle. So that's a five foot center to center. Um, if you're not farming with a tractor, you could just do the middle of the path to the middle of the path. It's kind of the same kind of math. Um, so then the yeah. bed itself Well, the growing space can depend on how thin your tractor wheels are, but it'd probably be, um, so this is 60 inches, and that'd probably be like 36 inches, and that might be 24 inches, more or less. Um, on, on, on a bed like this, we, so this is not, we don't really use the raised beds, but the tractors kind of compact the ground a little bit. We would do three rows, and we do 15 inches between the row. So that means like from plant to plant, there's 30 inches. But there's an area on the outside that we don't really want to be squishing or compacting. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about plant spacing today, but I would say that having a uniform system makes it easier to work with. So if you're using tractors, well, I mean, if your tines or your, your, your cages, they're at a spacing, so you want to place it so that you don't have to change it between each crop. So if you're doing three rows, I would do three rows like this. You could do, choose to do two rows with 30 inches apart, or choose to do 
one row in the middle. Um, and in all these schemes, you can use similar equipment to weed them. Um, and um, if you're farming with manual tools, you're not as restricted by the, the machinery, but your hose have a certain size, and your tools still have a certain size, so it's, it's worth having a specific scheme. And um, it also makes it just easier to think in your head when things are in a, on, on, on a limited system, you know, uh, or, or, a, or a modular system. So bringing this back to these benchmarks, if on a bed foot you can produce 250, which is a 100-foot bed would be $250. On a full acre, it's about $20,000. Um, if you can produce $5 per bed foot, that's $40,000. And if you can produce $750, that's $60,000. You know, it goes higher and it goes lower, because that's how math works. But, but these are kind of just benchmarks. And so on our farm, you know, if you have three heads of lettuce and you have you harvest two heads and sell them, and they're 250 apiece, that's five bucks. I know that when I have five dollars out of a bed foot, I'm in a 40,000 range. I like this. I like this spot here. Now, obviously, it can seem really nice to be very high on this, and that's kind of where you want to be, but it depends on your scale. If you're growing less than an acre of crop, especially like a half an acre of crop, you want to be high up here on your crops because otherwise you're not making money. If you're growing 10 acres, you can be here and probably be profitable. If you're growing 100 acres and you're making 20 thou on each of those acres, you're probably happy. Um, not to say you wouldn't be happy to be doing 60 thou on 100 acres, but there's probably a lot of other expenses that come into that. Um, so you have to realize there's no one right place to be in this. It's just that depending on your scale, you'll situate on a specific place. And what I'm talking about today is going to tend towards more smaller scale, but realize that the thinking changes in function of what you're, well, the thinking's the same, but you kind of where you want to be changes in function of your scale. So we'll look a little bit at what that means. So let's say you harvest 300, so it's three lettuce, so it's three rows of lettuce with one foot spacing in row. You can harvest 300 heads off of a 100 bed foot. Let's say you can sell them for 250 a piece. That means there's $750 that you can make off of that bed. So that's $60,000 an acre if you were to grow an all an acre of it, but we're just growing a 100 foot bed. Um, now, maybe you only manage to harvest 200 heads and sell them. And there's 100 that you've lost in here. It could be groundhogs. <laughs> it could be some kind of disease pressure. It could be that it got really hot and stuff started to bolt. Rarely can you sell the full potential of what you're growing. And so at that same price, you're down to $500 a bed, uh, on this bed foot, or on the 100-foot bed. So that's a $40,000 an acre. Now, there's another variable other than just your yield, which is the price. If you can raise your price a bit, you'll make more off of that. Now, you might choose to change your planting density. You start growing five rows per bed. And so that's a lot more heads in there. At the same price, you're making 1250. So this is something that might be um, like 90, or $100,000 an acre. That looks phenomenal. Who wouldn't want that? But maybe the heads are a little bit smaller <laughs> because they're grown so tight, or you choose varieties that are smaller. So therefore, you have to charge a little bit less. And that brings you down to $1,000, that 100-foot bed. It's still an interesting number. You know, it's still twice as much as here. But again, you don't manage to harvest everything. And it's possible that with this, big de this higher density, there's less air circulation, there's more rot, you lose more plants. Or it's harder to control weeds. The weed pressure comes up, you lose more plants. But in this case, you're down to 300 heads at $2 each. You're at $600 a bed foot, and that's the same amount here. But you started off with almost twice the number of plants. So in this scenario, 
there's a lot more work that goes into it. You know, there's the cost of the seed, the cost of starting the greenhouse, cost of transplanting them. There's the work of weeding them. And then um, even you're even harvesting more because there's more heads in, in it. Um, so you have to be careful when you're changing your system or trying to get very intensive that you're actually able to succeed at that. And not to say there's not people who are doing this, and there are people who are doing this, but you have to control all the pieces to do it well. And just because it works well on paper or on another farm doesn't mean that you can adopt it without a learning curve. And so sometimes it's better to space things out a little bit more so you can weed better, so you can have better disease control to get a profit that's maybe more, I guess, healthy for your farm. We good with this kind of process? So when you look at the full list of crops, they break down into different groups. I have, a, I have some dollar values associated with here. Don't trust the dollar values too much. It's more the categories that are important. So the crops that tend to be the most profitable in space are things like bunched herbs or bunched greens because you can often cut multiple times and get a, a lot of it, a, a, off it. If you think about, so something like cilantro, if you can plant like five or seven rows in a bed, it doesn't take much to get uh, three, four, five bunches out of that area, and you might be able to get a second bunch, uh, a second cut off of it. Something like thyme or oregano, you can maybe get five bunches of thyme off of a plant over the whole season. Stuff like kale, you could get five, six bunches of kale off of a plant. So, you know, if each bunch is being sold for three bucks, each plant is worth 15 bucks, that's how you get very profitable off of a crop like that. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants can produce really, really well. But there's a bit of a caveat that you have to have the right varieties and you have to have the right management system. And I don't know much about growing tomatoes and eggplants and peppers in, our, in, in your climate, climate. I know where we are. If we can get them under tunnels and keep the rain off of them, our, our, our marketable yield is a lot better than if we grow them in the field. You know? And there is a dramatic difference between varieties. So having the right growing systems and the right varieties are part of what make that. Now, that next group of what's profitable but not the most profitable, includes things like root crops, you know, carrots, beets, turnips. And one of the limiting things is you can only fit so many of those roots in a physical space. So you're, that's kind of what the limiting factor is. Lettuce heads, it's the same thing. You're kind of so many, only so many heads. Salad greens, and there's a whole mystique about salad greens these days, kind of as the secret great crop to success. And there's different parts of that. One can be how much can you make per pound? Are you making $8 a pound? Are you making $16 a pound? You know, that really changes that, that scenario. And if you're making $16 a pound, maybe this is, is more than just profitable. If you're making $8 a pound, it's probably profitable, but not the top notch. It can also depend on how many cuts you get off of the crop. Sometimes getting two, crop, two cuts is all you can do before it's going to bolt. So in other situations, maybe you can get five, six, seven cuts. So, so that's part of what can change salad greens between profitability levels. And then zucchini, cucumber, squash, if you have decent varieties and you have a decent price, they're usually profitable. And then the things that are less profitable, there's beans and peas, there's broccoli and cauliflower. Broccoli and cauliflower, the heading brassicas, take a lot of space. And that's, that's the challenge for them. And you don't see a lot of those crops on the smallest of farms. And then there's potatoes. Um, now, something in all this, and it's really true for these, is how much can you charge for it? If you're getting three or four dollars a pound for beans, maybe they're down here. If your market can bear six dollars a pound or seven dollars a pound of beans, suddenly they're up here. Not everybody has access to that. It can be that you're selling to restaurants in smaller volumes, you're able to, to charge more. It can be that you have a niche market that's willing to have a certain price. It can also be you have a variety that no one else has and that you're able to ask that price. It's also true for potatoes. If you're selling potatoes at 50 cents a pound, um, I wouldn't recommend that you grow them unless you're mechanized and have enough acreage to put in them. 
But if you're at a farmer's market and you can sell them for about 50, two bucks, 250 a pound, maybe three bucks a pound, they start to creep up here. You know? So if, if you're getting, because there, there's nothing like fresh potatoes. Um, and then also there's different varieties with different, uh, different colors. Those are all ways, and some of them have good yield, and those are all ways that you can raise that price. And that's what makes a crop more profitable. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. You're good with this? So I've been talking about dollars per acre in terms of one crop in one spot. But you can also get plant more than one thing after the other during the growing season. So if you have a lettuce crop that you can make $40,000 an acre, and after you harvest it, you put another lettuce crop that you can make $40,000 an acre on it, each of those beds is producing $80,000 uh, $80, an acre. And this is the trick on the smallest of acreages to make the most revenue. The larger your farm gets, though, the harder it is to, to effectively have two, three crops per area. On our farm, we find that we're just always missing the time. You know, you wait too long to destroy something, it's gotten a little bit woody, so then it's harder to incorporate and there's more residue and you're not happy than, uh, with the following uh, crop. Or it could be if you have the weed pressure is too high. These are all things that make it tougher. And you also have more acreage that you're taking care of, so you have less interest in just flipping two or three beds. But on the smallest acreage, being able to be on top of flipping beds into another crop is the secret to, to generating more revenue. So now we'll talk about the second metric in terms of, uh, of profit benchmarks. So how much can you harvest in an hour? Here are some numbers that I've put down so we can talk about them, but they probably don't represent your farm. <laughs> but they're good to kind of talk about. So on this, uh, this hypothetical farm, a fifth of the time is spent crop establishing a crop. So that's planting it, weeding it, or actually it's mostly the bed prep and the crop, uh, the planting. The next fifth of the time is maintaining the crop. So that's weeding, trellising. And then there's a fifth of the time is harvesting, washing, storing. Then there's a fifth that's selling the crop, bringing it to market, making the connections with, with sellers. And then there's a fifth of administration, planning, um, maintaining machinery. Um, so these are the things that fill up a farmer's life. Now, you only make money here. So 100% of your revenue comes from roughly 20% of your time. And you can only sell what you harvest here. So 100% of your revenue is going to come from 20% of your harvesting time. And you might actually have to harvest a little bit more than 100% of your revenue to make sure you actually have what you sell. And so these are kind of some of your bottlenecks. Now marketing, once you have your marketing channels, usually that's not the bottleneck. You know? Sometimes it's that you don't have the produce to sell, but usually you can find the markets. It's really this part of how much can you get through your system in an hour. So, if a full-time farmer is working 2,000 hours, 20% would mean they do about 400 harvest hours per person. So if you're two people, that's 800 harvest hours. So if you have two people at 400 harvest hours each, at 800 harvest hours, and let's say you want to make $40,000 gross sales on your farm. So you do 40,000 divided by the 800 means you have to harvest at a rate, harvest and wash at a rate of $50 an hour. Now, if you want to make more money and you have the same harvest time, you got to <laughs> harvest quicker. Now, if you can cut down your non-harvest task time to create more time to harvest, so this is a still, so two people suddenly get 600 harvest hours in, you know, they have 50% more harvest time. If you're trying to make that 40 thou, you only have to harvest that $34 an hour. If you can harvest at that $50 an hour, this first one, you can be making 60, 60 thou. And if you're at that rate of $75 an hour with that more harvest time, you can make $90,000 an hour. So there's two variables in here. There's how much time do you spend harvesting, and there's how fast do you harvest. And raising both of those really have a productivity. And um, 
you know, good weed control is probably the big secret of how to be able to spend more time harvesting. And um, um, yeah, does this math make sense? So let's look at it here. So if you have 50 carrot bunches that you're harvesting, it takes about three hours, you can sell them 250 a bunch, that's $45 an hour. If you raise your price, so price raising is always a variable, you can make it $54 an hour. If you can do it in less time, you're suddenly at $67 an hour. And if you can raise your price and do it in less time, you're at $81 an hour. So this corresponds to that forty dollars to $60,000 on the other slide. Um, yeah. Now, we'll talk about pricing more, or if we talk, we'll talk about pricing more a little bit in the marketing. We'll talk, so this challenge, what's, what's the trick to go from three hours to two hours to harvest the same thing? And so here are different things to har improve your harvest efficiency. So one is bring everything you need to the field. If you forget a knife, or you run out of elastics, or you don't have enough harvest bins, those are all things that slow you down. So make sure you have everything in the field. Systematize your harvest processes. So this is, I mean, if you have staff, this is vital. You can tell them this is how we do it. And if somebody has a quicker method, or says they have a quicker method, then you can, you know, you can have a race or you can test it to see if it is. And if it is a quicker method, change your processes, update them. Um, and even if you're farming by yourself, it's worth taking the time to make a system of how you do it so that you know like some days you're not, so gr you're not feeling so great, you can still do the same thing. When you're harvesting, fill your hands before you return your hands to the bin. So if you're doing beans, you want full hands of beans before you put in the bean. If you're getting cherry tomatoes, same thing. You're getting full-size tomatoes. If you can fit two in each hand, do that before you bring them in. That really reduces the amount of time you're moving. Have sharp harvest tools. It's a blunt tool really can't cut effectively. You know, something that can just do one cut as opposed to having to hack away at something, that'll speed you up. And then work on other farms. And this is the real secret, is working on other farms. Um, having experience in, on other farms helps you in all kinds of way when you launch a farm. But I have seen many farmers with no farm experience start very successful farms. And there's all kinds of resources that, to, to do that. But the one thing that they never do as well as people who've been trained in other farms is the harvest. When you've worked on a good farm, you, know how, you learn how to move. Now, I guess the one exception is I've seen people who, come, who work in kitchens and some athletes that when they get into farming, they just get it of how you, how you, how you move your body to harvest. But that's usually exceptions. Um, but when you've worked on a farm and you know you harvest 10,000 heads of lettuce in a year, you get it in your bot and you've been shown how to do it, you learn how to do it. And that is what you bring back to your farm. And it's something that you can go to a workshop and someone can give you all kinds of slides about the best harvesting technique, but it's actually doing it is where you really get it into your body. Versus like the planning, you can go to a workshop and you can learn planning, especially this workshop, you can learn fantastic planning. But but, you're, but you can't learn, this is a skill that I would really encourage. If, if you've already started your business and you haven't worked on other farms, go volunteer on good farms and see how they do things. And it's, it, this really changes your profitability, being able to harvest quicker. So the crops that are generally more profitable in time is stuff like bunch herbs and bunch greens, because that, you know, you can pull them off a plant or cut them off a plant, throw them on an elastic. Often. They're fairly clean. You just have to do a quick dunk. Maybe you can even take 10 bunches at a time and dunk them. They're easy to get through a system. You know, lettuce heads, you know, if you have that sharp knife, you can just work through a bed harvesting it. Tomatoes, eggplants can be very quick to harvest. Peppers, if you can get, you know, $1 to $2 a pepper, even two fifty dollars a pepper, it is phenomenal how profitable peppers are. There's, there's nothing like it, like, like something that you can be harvesting at $500 to $1,500 an hour. You have to have the market for that has that, those prices. Stuff that's profitable, but not as profitable, is, is bunched roots. So carrots, beets, there's just more steps to get them out of the ground, elastic on them, and then clean. And cleaning is a big thing. Uh, is this based off of poundage or based off of uh, some kind of unit? 
Um, does it matter? Or? I'm just curious. Um, sorry. Um, I, I think it's, it's one or the other. So it depends. Often, basing, selling by the unit, you can get a better price than selling by the pound. Um, so like if, you're able, if you're at a farmer's market and you can sell individual peppers for $1.50, you might be able to sell, sell, get a better price than if you're selling a pound for, I don't know, $2.99 or $3.99. Well, that depends on how you work on your farm. Okay. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying is if you get a price that you, I mean, if you can get $7.99 a pound for peppers, that's really great. If you can get only 99 cents a pound for peppers, they're probably going to be lower in the profitability in time. The but the will vary, will vary depending on the, on the crop. Yeah, depending on the crop and the pricing that you're doing. And these are things to think about. And that's why I'm kind of providing the tools to think about it. But then this is kind of just general reflections. If you're doing a small farm, so it de what, what size farm do you, would you like to, to, to be running, or are you running? This year it'll probably be about a third of an acre. A third of an acre. So if you're on a third of an acre, you need to get top dollar for your crop. Right. So you're probably moving towards individual peppers as opposed to talking about dollar per pound. Um, if you were doing 10 acres, it's, it's, a, different, it's a different situation. Um, size? Size of, of the, the farm itself. Yeah, the size, probably there's often a direct relation, re, re, relationship with how you're actually going to market it. Because um, if you have a small acreage, then every crop is, is, va is important. And you want to get everything to market at a good price. Because you, you're, you have a limited resource that you're producing on. If you're producing on a larger acreage, Sometimes you can have a little bit more spoilage to get the rest at a good price, or you can sell at a lower price because the volume is just going to offset that amount. But there's only so much you can get out of a third of an acre. Hmm. Okay, so bunched roots, there's a lot more involved in them. Broccoli, cabbage, what's challenging about that is, is they're bulky and they're heavy, so that slows you down. Salad greens, there is some fantastic tools out there, but generally they're not as profitable as, as, as these other crops. Same for cukes, zooks, squash. And the less profitable in times are beans and peas, and this might not surprise you if you grow these, that they're at the bottom. Um, again, it depends on the price, but it's tough. I have seen some phenomenal bean pickers, but it seems to be something inherent in the individual that is very hard to transmit to other people. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how you t talk to them. But um, um, so I don't see a lot of beans and peas on the smallest farms. And it's something that if you are growing and you're not, and you're not making money on it, maybe think about doing something else or growing them just for yourself to eat or if you can raise your price somehow. Also market dependent. Market dependent? Yeah. We thought about doing beans and peas, but you only pick your own. Yeah, well, that's, 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 just, that's another aspect, yeah. Yeah, so if you grew something else beforehand and then grew beans and peas. So in terms of the space, that works out. But in terms of the time, it, you might be losing money on the beans and peas. So, so it's a kind of an opportunity cost of picking something else. Also, there's, you talked about using it as a, as a cover crop. The challenge with beans and peas as a cover crop is that you are harvesting the part of the plant that all the nitrogen is going into. So harvesting the peas and exporting it means that you're not really, it's not as an effective cover crop as if you grew a field of, I don't know, peas or soybeans and then just tilled it in without harvesting it. So they're, they're, you, don't, you don't benefit from the nitrogen fixation the same way in that. So another part is how much time are they in the ground? And so these are two crops and they're very different in how, uh, how we deal with them. So leeks, maybe you can get two or three bunches per bed foot. Maybe you can get $4 a bed foot, a, a bunch. That's something like 80,000 an acre. When you look at that number, that's a nice number. Radishes, hard to get as good a yield. Maybe it's half the, half, half, half the dollars per acre. Um, so just on that metric, leeks seem to win. With leeks, so this is my dates, OK? I think they're probably earlier here, but we see it in the greenhouse on March 10th. 
couple months in the greenhouse. Then we transplanted the field on May 10th. Then we weed them and all kinds of things through the season, mainly weeding. And then we harvest them October 10th. So the seven months of love that we're giving the, those leeks. Five months of actual field space. Um, the radishes, we direct seed the same time we plant the, the, the leeks, May 10th. One month later, maybe even less than that, we've harvested them and they're sold. If you have good bed prep, you might not even have to weed this. So one month in the field. These five months in the field, you could have five radish crops during that time. So five times that 40K an acre, that's $200,000 an acre that you could be getting from the same, same area. There are challenges to that. There's a little bit extra work that goes into it. But you can see that there's a difference in the cost for your farm. Now, if you're a bit of a larger farm and you're well mechanized for weeding, it's possible leeks are really a cakewalk. They're not that big of a challenge. But if you're a smaller farm, that's land that's locked up in something that could be doing something else. Yeah. Yeah, talking about time and varieties, so would you decide only for one or two varieties that they will be harvested at the same time? But you don't combine plants to let's say that you have it through the what you're putting in the field, putting crops side by side? Yes, yeah. Um so maybe let's write this so you talk so you just talk about what to plant together. Yeah. So you have that bed for seven months. Yeah. It takes a long time. But if you do it radishes, so you, as you said, you could plant several crops. On yeah. Bed. Yeah. But if you combine, let's say, different timing plants, yeah. uh, like radishes and leeks on the same bed, so of course the bed has to stay longer because of the leeks, but through that time you could have the radishes. Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, maybe, so you're talking about planting in the same bed, multiple things, or? Pretty much, yeah, in that system. So you, you don't do that. We tend to plant one crop in a space at a certain time. There are some farmers who might, um, um, oh, where's my, what's up here? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, it, it, it does. <laughs> um, so I'll just, let me, t you can tell me if this is, if I'm understanding the right thing. So let's say in a greenhouse, maybe you have a bed, in the early season you plant spinach, you know, so you have a bunch of spinach, and then once it's warm enough, you might knock out the middle rows, and you can plant tomatoes. And then as they're growing, you keep planting, harvesting the spinach, and then when the spinach is spent, you destroy it, and then you have the tomatoes. Maybe you choose to put a basil plant on each side. I don't know. Is that what you mean? Kind of like intercropping. So, um, so this can, you can do this. Maybe with, if you're talking with leeks and radishes, maybe you have three re weeks rows of leeks, and then you plant some radishes in between, and you're harvesting the radishes beforehand. Um, this can be a way to optimize a long-growing crop. Um, I, it does kind of come back to the comment about tractor use. It depends how you're farming. This is always going to be more work at the specific time than doing a separate thing. It's possible it's less work overall, but um, probably more in a context where you're doing a lot of things more manually. Um, uh, I've seen some pictures, I think they were from Cuba, of a lot of farmers farming in their organoponicos, um, where they kind of have raised beds, and there's like, you know, it's more in an urban context, and they'll have like, they'll grow, I think like cabbages on the outside, and then some radishes, and then a zucchini in the middle, or a cucumber in the middle, something like that, and then, so they'll harvest these first, and then those next, and then this plant will take over. And so there's, there's sequences like that. And I, I think that, that that is a strategy to maximize the use of small areas. But as larger areas, you're probably trying to maximize more the type of task you're doing at each point. And so, um, like in, if you have greenhouse tomatoes, 
it's a lot more irritating to work around plants on the outside, you know, than just working around the, 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 the plants. And then um, you're kind of compromising maybe your tomatoes if you don't do it well because there's a little less ventilation. And maybe your bed isn't prepared as well because you prepared it a bit earlier and had something in it. Um, so these are strategies to explore. And if you do them well, they can be very, very, uh, very effective. But they kind of use more skill to do well. So effective, but could you lose profitability? Well, um, I guess it can. Time, it could be, and that's where the skill comes off. Um, you could lose profitability in time. I think if you have, like, so this, I mean, you could go down with a transplanter and plant three rows of leeks, and then you go down with your cedar and put a row, row of radishes down this and a row of radishes coming back this way. Um, when you're harvesting, and so in that case, you, it's not, like, it's, it's, it's half the bed prep, you know? Um, when you're harvesting, you've got to be really careful not to d damage the leeks. And you've got to be really clear with your team that, that that's an important part. Um, and you don't want to leave radishes behind. You don't want them to become a, weeding pro a weed problem. And that is one challenge that, in this context, you couldn't run down with your budding cage or to, to, to weed this. Um, you'd be limited using a hoe to go down, or maybe a tine weeder, um, at least until the radishes are out. Once the radishes are out, then you can probably move something that's a bit more mechanical and be happy with that. Yep. There's also, besides the intercropping, uh, sometimes we do the companion planting. Yep. Which will put the basil with our tomatoes and reduces our tomato worms. Tomato worms. Yeah. 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 We're on a smaller scale. We're not doing tracking. Yeah. OK. And I don't think I'm going to jump into companion planting right now. OK. All right. So, so again. And depending on your scale, one of these is probably better for you. The next thing to think about is how, how, how hard is it to grow that crop? Something tomatoes versus radish. Radish, you see it in the ground. Four weeks later, you harvest it. You seeded it too densely. Next time, you seed it less densely. You know? If it grew bad, maybe because you didn't irrigate it, next time you water it. You can grow it seven or eight times, maybe even 20 times in the same season if you're seeding every week, maybe not in the same spot. But radishes, you can become a samurai radish warrior in like <laughs> a year, you know? But tomatoes, you plant them generally one time. Maybe you plant a couple, but you don't usually know if it's going to work until three, four months later. You have all kinds of challenges that can come in. If you're grafting onto plants, there's a whole skill set that comes into there. Um, and then, you know, once they're growing, there's all kinds of diseases, both soil-borne and foliar, that create challenges. And then sometimes, even if you're in a greenhouse, is how you're pruning the, 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 the clusters and all that kind of management and, and, and what to do. So, yes, tomatoes can be producing $200,000 an acre and more if you know what you're doing. This, um, you might, each individual planting might not make as much, but you can generate as much over the season almost not knowing anything. And it's, it, you do know something, OK? Like, the, like farming sometimes really gets put down, and, but there's so much knowledge that goes into it, even a crop like radishes. Um, so, but this is something to be honest with yourself about where you're at. And if you don't have, um, solid growing experience, not to say you shouldn't grow tomatoes. I, I do think you should, people like tomatoes. Um, but understand what the limitations are and maybe take the efforts to get trained in that. You, know, you, go, to a, you go to a workshop or a course, you read a book, um, you see an extension agent, figure out how to do that, that, those crops. But without getting that extra knowledge, you might have a couple good years that really, really make you happy, but eventually you will have a problem with some of those trickier crops. Like, you will definitely have that problem if you don't learn some stuff. And some problems you can fix in the season, but some problems, by the time you've identified it, it is too late. And then next year, you know better. Um, yeah. And the last piece, really, about this profitability benchmarks is can you sell everything? So talk about radishes again. 
So you can, let's say you've got 100, 100 bed feet and you can harvest two bunches per bed foot. That's 200 bunches. You sell them at 250 a bunch. That's $500 that you can make. That's 40,000 an acre. Now, you're selling a farmer's market. You bring 200 bunches, but you only sell 100 bunches. The other 100 you eat or you give to your pigs or um, give to all your friends. So you're only making 250 if you sell half of it. That's $20,000 an acre. So there's a potential, but there's what you actually do. And what you actually do is where the profit comes. So um, you could choose to grow a little bit less and bring less to market so that you're getting the top value off of, the, off of that crop. Um, but you don't want to be selling only half all the time because that's eating up your profitability. So what five crops would you grow? <laughs> now, um, on the smallest farms, you probably don't grow as much as on a larger farm. But even if you're growing a lot of crops, you probably only have a handful that are bringing in the largest amounts of the revenue. And it's good to think about what those crops are and to you know, write them down, know what they are, and focus on those. What, is someone, what, 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 what does somebody think their top money maker is going to be as a crop? Tomatoes? And is that anything about them specific that? Uh, Big demand at our market for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Um, we're also doing some that are a little bit different. Our area, they want taste versus just. What yeah. Like. They like the quality, not just the size. Yeah. A different crop other than tomatoes? Sweet corn. Sweet corn. Now, sweet corn, are you going to grow some on your third of an acre? <laughs> OK. <laughs> So I think you're less, you, you, what I'm saying, you, you, you hear that, yeah, and you might have already realized that. But so that's, 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 people like sweet corn, you know. If you have a neighbor that has sweet corn, maybe you could bring some to market for him, but, uh, or, or for her. Other crops? Herbs. Turnips? Herbs. Herbs, yeah. Do you have a market for a lot of herbs? Yeah. Okay. What kind of market, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, Like, is it farmer's market or is yeah, it like farmer's more? Market, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other other crops? Peppers. Peppers. I like peppers. <laughs> and those little picnic peppers. Like the lunchbox ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who here thinks that salad greens will be a top crop for them? I want to put your hands up on the salad greens. There's definitely a movement towards salad greens that that's coming on. Um, and we've talked a bit about those. Other crops that, uh, that, that haven't been mentioned? Like little watermelons. Um, I have little watermelons. Yeah. Why? Can you get a lot out of, out of an area? No. No, I have the growing area. OK. What's your total acreage that you grow? Not of watermelons, but of everything? Of an acre. OK. Um, do, you th do you think the watermelons are paying for their space? Okay. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Not trying to put you on the spot, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But there are questions you should ask yourself continuously. Put yourself on the spot. I'm just going to take. So somebody. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you 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 have a cut because there's less growers. People growing beets by growing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what happens when everybody turns into vet salad green growers. There creates a niche for fantastic root growers. And so, um, and that's what to say, there's, there's a place for all types of farms and all kinds of scales. And, and not to only think that there's one type of farm that's going to feed the world. So you had your hand up? OK. Is there specific crops that you that you don't mind mentioning? Oh yeah, so the yard long beans okay. are phenomenal for the Philippine market. Yeah. And then for the uh, Hispanic market, uh, specific types of squash that you normally don't find. So yeah. There's some Guatemalan squash and Mexican squashes that are not real prevalent in the market. Give us a balance. 
Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that's, that, that's, I, I like that you brought that in, that there's, you, can, you can market different ways um, in the same market. It's, uh, it, it's, it's very important to know. Um, um, yeah, which in a moment we're going to talk about how will you sell what you grow. So that's kind of an important thing to know. But beforehand, I just want to talk about um, weekly targets. Yeah. Is everybody okay for another 15 minutes or so before we take, take a break? Yeah. So can, mo can most of you see when I'm down here? Okay. Um, so let's say... Um, you're trying to make forty thousand dollars over the season. When do the farmers markets start in this area? May. May? So except that May first, is that honest? Yeah. And when is the end of a good farmers market season about? What month or what date? Beginning of October. So like October first or like October fifteenth? Yeah. You have to both. <laughs> That's. Let's say October 1st. So that's May, June, July, August, September. So that's five months. Yeah. So it's about 20 weeks. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so $40,000, you're trying to make over 20 weeks. If you do that divided by that, you need to make $2,000 a week. Not the hardest math. <laughs> um, now. No, this is sales. Well, that depends. So if this number is sales, this is sales. If this number is profit, this is profit. Okay? So um, you've got to be consistent. Now, there's different ways you could do that. Maybe that means that you're making 1,000 at the beginning, 2,000 or 3,000 in the middle, and then 2,000 in the end, and it's an average of 2,000 a week. So that's, that's one way to look at it. But you could also try to be making 2,000 a week from the beginning and maintain that through. And they're, they're sort of different kind of headspaces. Because here, you're really banking on the middle of this. You're probably your summer crops that really love the heat. Some years are a little bit colder. You know, sometimes there's a deep breeze pressure that comes through and can give you a hard time. And this becomes a bit of a, of a weakness. Um, and also, if you have a lot of crop coming out at this point, you might need more labor at this point. Do you have the availability to hire somebody extra at that point? So I would encourage, and this is not to say that you can't pull this off, okay? I think good planning, you can pull just about any scenario off. But often, trying to raise your early sales means that you can better use your labor earlier in the year and provide work for people for a set number of people for longer in the season. It also means you're less vulnerable to crop failures or specific problems that might come to crops that are only grown once. And so, um, yeah. Now, so, that, so that's one thought is, is, is trying to look for more of a steady, steady sales volume. Um, it also helps from burning out. Sometimes when you have, like, August on our farm is really big. With the garlic comes in, we have a garlic festival, the onions are coming in, like, and so um, I totally understand how this happens, you know. And we make a point in slowing down on Friday afternoons. We actually stop an hour early on Friday afternoons in August because we know people are working so hard that we don't want them to burn out. What we found is that when you burn your staff out in August, in October, they're working like 30% lower, <laughs> slower, you know? You can see something in, in, in how they are. So we, and, and then they don't necessarily come back the next year, you know? And so we need to get to the end of the season with everybody on board and healthy. And so we really, we really look at that month of August and figure out how to keep the crazy under control. Um, and um, some years are worse than others. <laughs> it's, uh, but, um, but this is one way that you can do that. Another thing, and whether you're doing this or this, it's good to know what this target is because it gives you an idea of what you need to be pulling out of the ground to get there. And whether that's feasible or not, or, whether, or what it, would it take to make it feasible. Um, so 
We'll talk a little bit more about that, but not too I, it's more of a thought that I'm planting in your head. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. First, let's talk about how you're going to how, how you might sell your this yeah, how how you'll sell what you grow. So, farmers markets are the closest thing to uh, you know like a real free market. You go to the market, you put things on the table, people come up, they choose what they want, they give you money for it, and they leave. Very variable. You know. How are you going to plan for that? Um, and when you're starting off, it can seem really crazy. What does somebody buy at a farmer's market? What can you sell? But you sh probably should forecast of what you're going to sell so you can plan for it. And we'll talk about that after we talk about types of markets. But what happens for most markets, unless you're in like a high touristic area, or you're, there's like a specific annual event that happens once a year and there's like 10 times more than people that come, most people rely on a community of people to eat. And these people eat every day. <laughs> and they have to get groceries to eat every day. And as a vegetable grower at a farmer's market, you are somebody that they're coming to every week. There are certain types of, of stalls at a, vet, at a farmer's market that you, somebody comes two or three times in the year or just once in a year. and and that's just how often it is. But with, with a, a, vegetable, a, a vegetable producer, your clients come every week. And that means that you start to be able to forecast. So if you can sell 100 bunches of carrots in one week, the next week you're likely to sell 90, 100, 110. Not 20 or like 400. You know? And so over time, you start to be able to get a feel for what those numbers are, and you can plan for that. Now, in your early years, you might see that every week is better than the previous week. And um, most farmers that I know have a first farmer's market ever story where they get to the market with a truck full of bok choy and lettuce, and they put it out, and they sell $100, and they go home, and they're not feeling as excited as they did in the morning. <laughs> and, um, and you know, you can probably do better the following week. And it's just, you build it week after week after week. And you just have to do the work to, to, to build that relationship. But, but yes, over time, you start to see what people will buy. And it does change, so you have to pay attention. But still, you, it's, it's more predictive um, than you might think. Um, now, the other extreme is a CSA vegetable basket. Um, so. Do anybody here not, never heard about CSAs or community supported agriculture? Okay, I'm glad to hear that. You've probably been going to conferences <laughs> or maybe have one yourself. Um, but if, so, I'll, nonetheless, I'll, I'll just define it a bit. So, community supported agriculture is a system where people sign up at the end of the year and then they commit to getting vegetables every week for, for the season. And um, sometimes they pay in full up front, which is really great for cash flow, but sometimes they pay through the season. But what's really nice in any of these scenarios is that you know how many eaters you're planning for on a weekly basis. So if you have 100 CSA members and you want to give them lettuce every week, you need 100 lettuce heads every week. And so it's, CSA is the ideal in terms of mathematical planning. And um, so it makes your life a little bit easier. Then there's restaurants and grocery stores. And there is this ideal world where, in the winter, you go and sit down with your restaurant clients, and they tell you exactly what they want throughout the whole year and what price they'll do. And then you sign a contract, and you bring them that through the season, and they always take exactly what they said they would take. And if you have that relationship, that's phenomenal. <laughs> but in most cases, you know, restaurants, things change. You know, uh, fashions, trends change. What people want change. Sometimes staff changes. And they're a business just like us. And their margins, you know, they're not much, much better. So they have to make good decisions. And they're not able to plan out ahead, exact, or commit ahead. So often, week after week, um, it can change, you know. And you have good, it's good to, important to have good communication so that you know what's coming up. Um, but not to say, or in that situation, you can still sit down in the spring and kind of make a plan for what the season's going to be with, with, with your clients. And that's a good thing to do. And it can help them think a bit also, because sometimes they don't realize 
That's what the, 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 kind of st the kind of thinking that we need to do. And so it, it can start that dialogue uh, with them. Um, now, one thing also with restaurants and stores is this depends what kind of crops you're growing also about how vulnerable you are to people changing their mind. If you're growing potatoes that you're planting once and you're only harvesting later and suddenly they no longer want that variety, you got a lot of potatoes that you had, had, might have a market for. If you're growing salad greens and mid-June they decide they no longer want that, that mix or they no longer want arugula and they want red Russian kale or something, hey, you just start seeding something different. And four weeks later, you can meet that demand. And so on smaller farms that focus on selling to restaurants, the shorter your day to maturity crop, the more security you have because you can pivot to really meet the needs. And so that means that you want to listen and pay attention to what's happening and, um, and look at the orders. If you see that the orders are going down after a couple of weeks, Maybe just ask why that is. Is it because they have stuff left over? Or is it because they're, they're having a dip in sales? Or is it because they're no longer featuring that on their menu? Just kind of figure out why that is and change accordingly. And that's a flexibility that smaller for farms often have is to pivot better to, to, to deal with, uh, with restaurants and stores. There's also a difference between, I mean, there's a lot of similarities and differences and all stores and restaurants are different. But often restaurants, will not be able to take the biggest volume of things. It might take a lot of smaller volumes, whereas a store might be able to take a lot of less stuff. Um, and so that's something that um, you, if you can get into a relationship with a grocery store or a health food store, um, that you might be able to have a bigger market for larger amounts of less things. So it's something that's nice to have, be growing less diversity. And then there's new ways, ways that we don't know yet. Um, you know, there was a time that CSA veg, veg, vegetable baskets were the cutting edge of market gardening. And at this point, I think of them as traditional farmers market, or traditional marketing for, for organic farmers. Um, and, you know, when we started our farm in 2004, there was a real demand for CSAs. At this point, we still have a strong CSA but not all new CSA farms can jump in as easily. And so you have to think about where new ways to sell will be. Um, so something that we do is we sell garlic as seed stock. So we have an online store. Um, and people can order there, and we can ship it, or we can bring it to market. Um, we also sell seeds online. Now, I'm not saying that you should sell garlic online, but digital portals are a way that you can connect to people. Um, and if you're able to ship it, you can send it to anywhere that that item, I mean, it depends how perishable your item is, but that's, that's something that shipping and online portals have really changed the way we can market. But even for a farmer's market, you could have an online form, you know, take orders, prepare them, then somebody shows up and you have the order and you just hand it to them. So it can be a way for people to know what you have and do the thinking before they, sh they show up. And um, so um, this is something that Marketing is going to change. There's a lot more small farmers than there was. People talk about farmers market saturation. People talk about hard times to find CSA members. But there's still market share that I think we can develop. And there's also, if you have top-notch quality and you're fairly polite and have fairly good communication skills, you will prevail. It takes time. Not all the farms that are out there necessarily excel in all those things. So if you really excel, you will, you will do better down the line. You just got to be able to get to that down the line. And yeah. so where do you start marketing if you're not marketing currently? And that's, that's a, a big question because this is kind of the secret of your success. You know? How will you sell your vegetables? And um, if you used to work in grocery stores or in, pro or, or in kitchens, you might be well set up to sell to stores or kitchens. And there's two things about that. One is, if you work in a produce section, you can see what it is like to be on the buying side and see what people are looking for, what quantities, what quality, how the packing is. That's like secret information that people don't have. If you work in restaurants, you can see how, re how restaurants use produce and what kind of things are missing or what kind of things they love. 
But also, if you've worked on those, it gives you contacts of people to talk to, to potentially to sell. If you haven't worked in those fields, not to say you can't jump into them, but they can be harder to get into if you don't have that contact point. And so a lot of what we're doing is relationship building. And so I think where you're starting, if you haven't marketed yet, is your friends, your family, your community. These are the people that love and want to support you, and they're the people that you should, you should turn to. I mean, don't, don't, don't harass them, <laughs> but, but, um, but, but, but if they want to support you, this is a way. So if you're doing CSA, it's your first year CSA, and, and I didn't talk too much about, about numbers in that way, but if it's your first time doing CSA, you've never done it, I would only do five or 10 shares. Um, there's a lot of stress that comes in with taking somebody's money before the season, and you want to be able to deliver. And there's also something like CSA, though mathematically works out great, you have to have nine to 12 vegetables every week. And that's sometimes, that, 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 that showing up with the diversity, it catches some people by surprise who haven't had to, had to do that. But if you just have five or 10 CSA shares, if you're in a community that you've been in for a while, it might not be hard to find five or 10 people that want to buy baskets from you. And those people might be more forgiving if your season doesn't go out quite as well as you're hoping, as opposed to some stranger that you've roped in to, to your new project. And so um, starting with, with, with the people that, that know and trust you is a good place to go. Not that you want to rip them off. I mean, you want to do your best to deliver, um, but, 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 but there's, there, there's a little bit more forgiveness maybe coming. And you grow from there. And you look, the best new clients you'll get are usually new clients that come from your best old clients. Because if somebody loves your vegetables and doesn't mind going up to some high school to get them every Tuesday to this select hour, they can transmit exactly what the, the, what, what the experience is like to somebody else. So that person gets in knowing what they want and they know who the right people is. And they won't choose their friends who are real a lot of work. You know, they're, they're going to pass on their, be their best friends to you. And that's what builds your network. Um, for sure, you can send out uh, postcards, you can do Facebook ads, and those aren't bad things to do. It's just you don't usually get the highest, the best customers right off the bat that way. Some of them will be, and those you, you want to keep on. Um, but, but that's, so what that means is that when you start, you're probably going to wind up starting smaller than you'd love to start. But if you nourish those relationships and you build the trust and you deliver, you're going to get bigger. And um, it also means that you've got to be nice to people, <laughs> which can be hard if you've been working 80 hours and it's really hot outside and you haven't slept well. Um, but, but when somebody complains, you know, smile and listen to them and figure out how to make amends, figure out how to change things. But, that complaint is an opportunity to, create, to, to further the relationship. If somebody gets, there's a worm in their broccoli, and they ask for it, you know, and they become the market, you can say, you can apologize, you can explain why it is, you can give them another broccoli, check to see that there's no worm, <laughs> and, 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 and hand that to them. And that making amends and that, and that, and that, and that listening to them, that can be, make your best clients can have at one point been your most trouble. <laughs> um, and so, you, you, you want to, I mean, that's how we want to be treated, right? And so I think that really being good people is going to change your, your relationship with your, peop, with your customers, and so that's what's going to grow. You do need good vegetables, too. <laughs> um, uh, I've seen people who don't have great vegetables and have really great networks, and sometimes it succeeds, but I think if you have great vegetables and you have great people skills and you invest in those relationships, you'll get to a place that you're happy to be, um, even if it takes a little bit longer than you want. And I think it's worth um, letting, letting the time take, let, let, taking the time it needs. And that might mean that at first you have to have some off-farm in income to, to get there. Um, but um, yeah. So I think on that note, we're going to stop for like 15 minutes. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how to make projections for your marketing. Sound good? Yeah. All right, so let's stretch. <laughs> So um, I thought I would just, before getting into the actual projections, I thought I'd just jump back into relationship building and just talk about how, so I've talked about this as how you get going, but 
this is something that's true the whole time of your, of your career. And it's true in all business, too, is that it's really about relationships. It's not these random people that exist out somewhere else that are buying things from you, though you do want to bring them into your community. But what's happening in that case is that you're building relationships with these people, and you're making a larger community. And, and, sort of, and, and the digital world permits it to be not based in, uh, uh, in place. But without talking about building out, there's also the people that are already in your, in, in your network. So once you, let's say, you, like we have a 500 member CSA, um, and so um, these people, you know, some of them have been with us for 15 years, some just three or four, and some are just coming in. And what I keep finding year after year is that the relationships we already have are our strongest part. And so we recently launched a, so we have a seed company where we sell seed packets. Um, and we have, an, we, have a, we, we, we have seed racks in retail, so we have a hold still seed program. But we launched a seed fundraiser. So organizations, school groups can sell our seeds, and they get the wholesale rate. So, uh, so let's say it retails for 350 They keep a set buck 75 we get a buck 75 So I think it's a good, it's a win-win kind of situation. And um, we've done this, this is our second year. The, last year we had two people. Two projects we were supporting that way. This year we wanted to get a dozen or so. We didn't want to get too big because, you know, you're, there's always things you didn't expect that happens <laughs> when you have a new project. And we didn't want to get, and we got caught, it was just two people, we got caught on a couple things even then. So we wanted a dozen people. And so rather than send this out on Facebook or kind of a call in the community at large, we sent an email to our, our CSA group. And um, just explaining the project briefly and said we're looking for about a dozen organizations. And within 20 minutes I got the first email back and it was somebody I've been in school with since I was, since I was 12 and they said, you know, my daughter's school might be interested in this. And then shortly afterwards there was a, a CSA member who comes out and volunteers a lot in the summer because she just likes to be on the farm and so she said, you know, her figure skating group might be interested in this. And then there's a couple CSA members who've been with us for 10 or 12 years and of the first six or seven people who responded, there was no one who I was surprised to see. Like they all, I knew we had a connection with them. Now when I sent this email out, I had no idea who was going to respond and anything can happen. But when it came back, what it validated is it was the people who were the most important to us and that were the most important to them, those were still the people that listened first. And so they buy veg they get vegetables from us every week. They don't get seeds from us necessarily, but they were happy to support a project from us because they trust us. And this also fits in, I mean, it's still something that's based in, or it's our, our, they're organic seeds, um, there's ecological worldview. Like it kind of fits the same kind of values, but they were happy to jump on board with us. And so, finding ways to, and I'll use the word leverage, but to, to, um, to, to build on these relationships and provide more to the people who already care about you and want your stuff is an easier way than going and finding a bunch of people who've never heard about you. So we have our CSA baskets as the foundation with them. Um, in the spring, we sell garden plants and we sell seeds for gardens, so these people are a large, like we sell to everybody, but there's a lot of clients that come from our CSA baskets. And then we buy in f organic fruit from other vendors and we sell it to our clients and our CSA members eat a lot of organic fruit and they're happy to get it from us. And we do bulk carrot orders in the fall and bulk garlic orders. Um, occasionally there's a livestock producer close to us if they don't have, ex if they don't have all the markets that they need, they'll ask if they can contact our CSA member through us and they're very happy, if, if we trust the product and we're happy to kind of to promote it, they're, they're more likely to purchase it because we have that, that relationship built. And we're not going to, like there was a couple years ago where we couldn't produce enough garlic to meet our demand. And we bought in garlic from another farm. And it's a farm that, that we know and we trust. And the garlic wasn't even lasting six weeks. They had had some kind of botrytis problem and it was, it was rotting. And we, you know, we started to get complaints from these people that we really like. And um, so we replaced it with some of the garlic that we did have. But we didn't have enough garlic to replace, you know, that's why we bought the garlic in. <laughs> um, but we canceled our other orders that were of, seed, of, gar of garlic seed so that we could deviate our own garlic to replace people 
who were complaining. And you know, at first it was one or two people, but then we realized it's definitely a problem. So we sent out an email to everybody who bought garlic from us, and we said, you know, we apologized, we explained, you know, what had happened. Um, we didn't blame the farm. We just kind of we, we acknowledged the problem, but took ownership of it because we were the intermediary. And we said, you know, if you want to replace it, we can try to replace it this year, or we can refund you. And some people definitely took us up on the offer, but at least half the people chose to keep the garlic that wasn't fantastic and um, one because they wanted to support us some way and they didn't want to cause extra burden because they realized that we were going to be absorbing that cost but it was something that we did this like we you know it was a lot of garlic that we purchased um, so we could see that it could potentially be a financial hit and um, but we we did that because we have to invest in this relationship. And that's what makes this relationship more valuable on both sides down the line. And that's how you can sell more things of when you recognize, when you admit when you made a mistake and you apologize and you try to make amends. Um, so um, yeah, I just wanted to end, end that part because um, that's, it's just as important to grow the current network you have and the current people you have as clients as it is to expand it into other people. Um, yeah. So let's talk about projections. And um, Did you that out of the way, is it right in front of your face? I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So um, this is a chart that's very smallly written, I realize that. <laughs> but it has a row. So this is each row is a different crop that we're growing in a different format with the price. And then each column is a different week of the year. And so for every outlet that we're going to sell products, we want to make a projection of what we think we're going to sell week by week. And so um, what that could look like with a CSA basket, and I've, I, I've um, don't worry too much about the exact details of this. It's more the process is that, you know, you decide to put, you know, a bunch of arugula, a bunch of head of broccoli, a bunch of cilantro, so forth, in your first week and so forth. And you kind of plan out the growing season on, uh, on, on, on a sheet. And then if you have 50 CSA members, you know, you need 50 times each of those items. Um, and that's your projection for your CSA. And then for your farmer's market, you can also do a projection week by week. And kind of going back to you know, when you haven't sold at a farmer's market before, this is a real guess. But a guess is better than nothing. It starts to kind of aim where you're going to be planning for. And you make that guess different ways. If you work for farms in the area, maybe you can ask them. You can go to farmer's markets and you can see what people are buying. Um, but, but you put it down. And then over time, that'll become a more educated guess. Um, but yeah, so you fill up your sheet. And whereas the CSA, you might have some items that you're just doing here and there. Generally at the farmer's market, you kind of want to stay consistent, have everything available that you have throughout many weeks. And so, um, so yeah, so you have, and then for restaurants, you can kind of do a similar process. And at the end, you'll have one sheet that just adds up. And so all the arugula you need for that outlet plus all the other outlets, okay? And what this becomes, this is your harvest targets for the coming season. On the week of the 2nd of July, you're hoping to harvest these things, and you, or you need to harvest these things to be able to sell what you planned to be able to make the sales that you want. Um, now, I'll just let you in on a secret that things don't turn out the way you planned, <laughs> but you kind of know which way you're trying to get to, you know, and you can adjust that. Um, um, yeah, so this is the starting point of the crop planning process, okay? Um, and I'm going to hurry this along, to, or hurry, m just move it along to get to the actual crop plan. So with this, um, yeah, so what a crop plan is, is it has three pieces. It has a field planting schedule, it has a greenhouse planting schedule, and it has a seed order. It can have more pieces, like you can have a bed preparation schedule, you can have a cover cropping schedule, you can have your fertility schedule. Those are all things that you can add in also, but at the basis, this is what you need to know. You need how much seed you need, when and, wh when and how much you're going to grow in the greenhouse, and then when and how much and maybe where are you going to grow it in the field. 
Now, let's talk about layout before we talk about the field. This is a picture, an overhead shot of our farm 15 years ago. It's changed a bit since then. Um, and it's broken up into blocks. And each of the rectangles is a block of the same size. And they are 14 beds wide. And the bed is 5 foot from center to center and 300 foot long. And it corresponds to roughly an acre, a half an acre. So in our first year, we had eight blocks like this. At this point, we have 24 blocks like this on our farm. And we break down our field into modular blocks that are the same length because this row cover can fit over here, or can fit over there, or can fit over here. Little bits like this are very annoying to move around, especially if you suddenly have a full bed here. You're kind of just cobbling together little pieces. Um, if you have sprinkler line or drip tape that fits here, you can move it around so your materials work. And then this block, if this was all broccolis, it's easy to move in a rotation around the field. And knowing what an, a, a bed more or less takes to do, to plant and stuff, mentally you can start to understand and compare between blocks. And I would say that you could just have a big rectangle that's, I think this was, I think this was a, a five acre field, I believe. Um, I guess I could, say, I could do the math of that. It's, this is two acres if you do. It's eight blocks time, or my math is not working. Eight half acre blocks is it's four acres, and then there's some other extra stuff. Um, but you could just have one big block, but it's hard to think about it. As you break it down into smaller pieces, it becomes easier to visualize it in your head and easier to think about. And that's what you're trying to always do is make things into like bite-sized pieces that you can think about and that don't become overwhelming. Um, and um, now, this is, works well on our farm. Um, we do use tractors um, and 300-foot beds work well for that. If we were in a system where we were just using like BCS walking tractors, um, we probably wouldn't have 300 foot beds. We'd probably have 50 or 100 foot beds that are long. And I mean, four, 14 beds or 15 beds wide, you know, that, that works. 10 beds wide works. We wouldn't have like 30 bed wide. That kind of starts to be a little bit too big for a block. But you kind of design your system around what works well for you and what fits on your farm, <laughs> uh, obviously. But um, tr having one modular system is way easier to think about than having even two modular systems that you're working with. So there is a link I'm going to show a little bit later that has this information on it. So don't try to take pictures and track it down this way. The, 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 link, the link will have all that. But um, one of the pieces is, once you start crop planning, is where do you get the information to plan? And so I'm providing some information. And this is um, a sheet that is included in the crop planning book. And we have one sheet for direct seeded crops and one sheet for transplanted crops. And I will say it is more conservative than ambitious in terms of, tar of yield numbers. And, um, uh, but it's a starting point. And so this is one place that you can get some of that information. So it has you know, the different crops, the days to maturity, how many rows per bed, how often you plant it, um, that kind of thing. Now, there's other places you can get references, too. So seed catalogs is a great place. Johnny's has a really phenomenal uh, guides for, uh, for growing information and spacing. High mowing's information is getting better and better with every catalog. Um, there are reference books. So Knott's, what is it, Knott's uh, Vegetable Handbook is a good place. And, um, and it's available online free now. Um, Talking to other farms in your area or other farms that you've worked for is a good, is a good ref a reference, too. And they know your climate probably better than a seed catalog that's printed in Maine does. Um, estimating. So this is kind of like just guessing a little bit. This is better than nothing. You know, figuring out, like, if I have this much of salad greens, how many pounds can I get out of it? You know, you're probably close to that ballpark. You're not going to think I can get 5,000 pounds out of here. <laughs> Um, unless you have a secret technique, <laughs> and you should be given the workshop, um, but, uh, or you don't want to give the workshop, and you just want to uh, master your market. But, um, but, but, but that estimating is really valuable, and I think we under, 
we underestimate our capacity to estimate. And so um, just think about it a bit. And then your own experience. And this is where you are aiming for, is that you want with time to know what you're able to achieve. And that takes a little bit of time to learn. Um, if you're starting new and don't have any experience, I think it takes at least three years to get a good feel of most crops. Now something like radishes, if you did grow them 22 weeks, 22 times in one year, after three years you've grown them 65 times or so, you know, you probably know how to grow radishes. <laughs> um, and and that's, that's a good thing to understand that some crops are going to get better experience with others. But after three years, you may have seen a really hot year, a really cold year, a really dry year, a really wet year, a year that had crazy hail. You know, you've seen a bit of variability, so you can start to learn how it goes. Because something is, one, there's no two years that are the same. And so is a good chance the next year is going to be different than your first year. So it's good to understand that. Um, uh, now, also, as you're farming, ideally, and I'm hoping this, you get better. <laughs> so the yields you get in your first year, I'm hoping, are less than the yields you get in your second year. And that can depend on weather, and it can depend on other things. But with time, one of the things you start to put more care in, you start to know what you need to do. And those are things that mean that your first years of farming, the yield data that you have might not be as valuable as the years like three through five are. And so that's kind of what goes into to building that experience. And that's, and that's, and that's what's going to, your experience is what's going to be the best thing for you to be planning around. Um, so when we're making field planting schedules, we're going to start with what we want to harvest every week, what we call a weekly harvest target. Then we'll determine when we want to plant it, and that's the field date, so the date that we're planting in the field, and how much to plant, so a bed length, and then we'll choose varieties. And so this is starting off with your harvest targets, and so you choose, there's a specific crop, and you know there's different weeks that you're harvesting a certain amount. And now, so I'm going to talk about tomatoes here. And so with tomatoes, though you're harvesting them many times, you're probably just planting once. So the total yield of all the weeks together is what you're trying to get out of that tomato plant. So this kind of something you plant once and harvest for a long time, in some ways, is the easiest thing to plan for. Um, so you have tomatoes, you want to get about a thousand plants. I think the numbers change a little bit between slides. I kept dr dro dropping a, a one, but about a thousand pounds over the season, you're going to plant it once. So when do you plant? And um, I did say don't trust my dates. Your dates are likely different. But so you have your harvest date, you subtract the DTM, which is days to maturity, and you get your plant date. So a days to maturity is something that a seed catalog often provides of how long it takes from the moment you plant it to the moment you harvest it. It's a really great number to have, and it makes all these formulas work really well. And it's sort of meaningless. <laughs> um, it's based on the conditions of where the trials were done, and it's based at a certain time in year. So um, um, what it is good for, well, one is to have great math, but another thing it's good for is comparison. So within the same catalog, if something has 50 days to maturity and another variety of the same vegetable has 7 day days to maturity, you can tell one is earlier than the other. And so that's what the purpose, the best purpose is in comparison purposes. It's hard to compare sometimes between two catalogs because they might evaluate things a little bit differently. But um, so you take it with a grain of salt, um, but it's still a number that you have and it's something to start with. Now one other part, um, so um, at days to maturity. So I'll come back to that part in a second. So just looking mathematically, so in our climate, if you're planting tomatoes in the field, you can't really harvest before around August 6th. I bet you can plant harvest earlier here. Um, and if it takes 63 days to maturity, that means we're you have to plant about June 4th. Our last frost date is at the end of May, so we might try to plant about May 28th. Okay? So that's kind of mathematically what that looks like. But I want to say one thing about the days to maturity is that there are two ways that days to maturity are listed in catalogs, from direct seeding and from transplanting. And they're not the same thing. So you should look to see if it's listed in the description somewhere what that is based on. 
Now, if you have a transplanted days to maturity, no, a, uh, well, between the two, um, let's say you have a lettuce. And if it's a, well, the difference is it's about two, you can knock off about 14 days off a direct seeded date to get the transplanted date, even if the crop is like four weeks in the greenhouse. Because there's a certain amount of transplant shock that happens. So it's about two weeks that you save by starting something beforehand. So that's just a, a loose number of converting one to the other. Okay. So this is time. This is when to plant. And then there's how much you plant. So you want to get, let's say, about 1,000 pounds. And we're going to have a lot of safety factors we're going to talk about. So SF is safety factor. And that's, um, I'm actually just going to do this right here, is let's say, You want to heart sell 1,000 heads of lettuce, OK? You're going to want to plant more than that 1,000 heads to make sure that they get to maturity. So um, a starting safety factor is about 1.3, OK? You can change it, or, but what is this worth 1.3? So that means you're planting a 1,300 heads with the hope of selling 1,000 heads. Now, these are transplanted in this example. So you start them in the greenhouse. You want to have more plants or more cells with lettuce in it than these 1,300 that you need to make sure you have enough that go on the ground. So if you do another 1.3, that's roughly about 400 extra plants. You want to have 1,700 cells that you're seeding to make sure you have 1,300 heads in the field. Now, lettuce seed can be a bit finicky to germinate, so maybe you put two seeds per cell. That means that that's 3,400 seeds that you're, that you, that you're going to be seeding into these cells. And then you buy the seeds. And maybe you buy another 30% so that you know you have enough when it's time to seed it. And so that's um, something about 1,000. So maybe it's 4,500 seeds that you purchase. So you purchase 4,500 seeds to get 1,000 heads. OK? So it's the same. We're working backwards in here. Now, there's a few things to say about this. Because um, it can look on some schemes like a lot of waste. Um, and but there's a lot of variability in life and in farming. And so you have to, 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 to accommodate that. Now, unless you drop some of the seeds on the greenhouse floor, there's a good chance you have some of these that left over. So maybe you have 1,000 seeds. And you hold them over to the next year or the next planting. Okay? So it's not, it's not pure waste. Maybe they don't, some seeds don't germinate as much well in the second year. So maybe in that case, maybe like parsnip seeds you don't hold over a second year. But having a little bit more to make sure you have this is going to make you feel more comfortable because you're going to curse if you don't have the seed when it's time to get it in the ground. Now, here, from the greenhouse to here, so here, so in this case, you're probably, you seed two. If all of them come out, you know, you're going to thin them down to one plant per, per cell. But here, you might have more than 1,300 plants. That, that survive in cells. Maybe you keep those extras for a week or two. You don't keep watering them for like three months, OK? <laughs> They're just a buffer in case some groundhog comes and eats something and you want to replant it, or in case there's another variety that didn't do so well and you want to replace it. You have, this is a security measure you have that can be used for something else. So you hold it for a week or two, and then you compost them. But that's, so it's not pure waste there. And then. You need 1,000 heads, but you actually have 1,200 that are good. If you can sell that extra 200, phenomenal. Go for it. I'm, you don't limit yourself to your crop plan. You, you, though, though, if it's going to take a lot of work and be pressure on your farm, maybe you make a decision whether to sell it or not. But I would say you probably try to sell it. And, and that's fantastic. But you do want to have that 1,000 heads that you need for your market. And you hope the market buys them, but that's uh, I can't control that. <laughs> um, but does this is this clear as a process? Okay. 
A lot of what we're going to talk about right now in some ways is filling in the holes between this. So we have our harvest needs. There's a safety factor of 1.3. And then there's the yields per bed foot. So here I've put down 2.2 pounds per bed foot. And that means it's about 700 bed feet of tomatoes to get that. Just two pounds of bed foot is not a huge amount for tomatoes. Um, but it's in a lot of catalogs. That's the amount that they recommend. Let's say you get 10 pounds per bed foot. You do the same math, and you're with like less than a quarter of the bed foot. Um, now, if you're talking about head lettuce, you know, you can literally see what the potential is. But something like tomatoes, you don't know how many tomatoes are going to come out of it in the year. You know, there's a lot that can change from a mediocre planting to a phenomenal planting. And those things can be variety at a starting point. Some varieties just, you know, the maturity date's different, or when they have peak yield is different. But then also, do they resist certain diseases? What diseases are more prevalent in your area? And then, so in our area, if we grow tomatoes in the field, there's a lot of humidity, and there's a lot of disease. We see a lot of bacterial speck and spot, um, some fungal diseases, and we have less marketable yield. Whereas if we grow them in a caterpillar tunnel, so with like plastic over it, just keeping the water off really increases what we can sell. And so it doesn't take much to get to 10 pounds a bed foot. And in fact, at this point, we're probably something at between 15 and 20 pounds a bed foot under tunnels. But it took us 15 years to get to that point. Now, when you're starting off, you don't know if you're a two pound a bed foot tomato grower or a 10 pound a bed foot tomato grower. You hope you're the second. And there's things you can do to improve that, but, um, but you don't know. And this is some of the thing that comes with experience. But being able to increase that yield reduces the number of beds that you need to do. And so it's a lot less work to do this than it is this, though it might involve building a tunnel. But either way, that's how the math works. Is that, is that good? OK. So now um, I'm going to start using some spreadsheets uh, online. And in the document, there's the link. Um, and um, yeah, so let's see if I can smoothly transition this. Yeah. Um, OK, so. Oh. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> OK, actually, if I click on this. Okay, this is not what I'm looking for. So if you click on that link, you'll get to a place where you can choose to either just get the spreadsheets or sign up for a newsletter I send out occasionally and get the spreadsheets. You can choose what you want to do, but either way you'll get to this. And um, so you can use any kind of spread. You can use paper for crop planning. It's, it takes a little bit, like the, the math doesn't happen automatically on the sheet. But, you, but if you're more comfortable using a paper and pen, go for it. Um, it's the thinking that's important, not the medium. But if you are comfortable with computers, computers do really have a lot more strength and computing power. And um, you can use Excel. I've been using Google, Doc, uh, Google Sheets a lot because it's easy, I find it easy to share with people. And I like the tool. But you can do whatever you wish.